Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to week two of our Total Joints Tell All lecture series. Uh, my name is Dr. Eddie Huang, and this is my partner with UT Orthopedics, uh, Dr. Zay Radwan. We're both assistant professors with UT Orthopedics, and uh, we're, we're here to talk to you a little bit about, the, uh, about arthritis. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Mathis for his amazing talk about the history and future of total joint replacements. If you haven't seen last week's lecture, I strongly recommend it. Um, but, but moving on, um, I will, um, I'd like to talk to you about our next lecture, which is the man, the myth, the legend, Uncle Arthur. Dr. Radwan, who is Uncle Arthur? So Uncle Arthur, you may have a real Uncle Arthur, but the Uncle Arthur we're talking about today is arthritis. And I commonly get told by patients that Uncle Arthur has come to visit and won't leave. So today we're going to give you a little more information about who Uncle Arthur is, um, what arthritis actually entails, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, and also we'll go into a little bit of other causes of pain around the joint that is not necessarily arthritis but can present in a similar way. And then at the end we'll briefly discuss when you should have surgery and what you can do prior to surgery. So Dr. Wong, I know a lot of there's a lot of talk of arthritis in the media and online. How common is arthritis and and how likely is someone to develop arthritis? Unfortunately, arthritis is probably one of the leading causes of a pain in, in America. It's definitely one of the most common reasons people tend to visit a physician right now. I think I think the most common reason uh, chief complaints for visiting a physician are headaches, back pain, and then joint pain. I would say the, the facts say about 24 million Americans are limited in some way from their, from their activities due to arthritis. About 25% of adults will experience some form of severe joint pain due to arthritis. And within the morbid obesity population, two in three patients will develop knee arthritis. Overall, during their entire lifetime, about 25% of patients will develop hip arthritis, and about 50% will develop knee arthritis by the age of 85. But, I mean, we, we we're talking about the, the phrase arthritis, but arthritis is actually a constellation of, of multiple causes. Uh, why don't you walk us through some of that? Sure. Um, so, as Dr. Wong said, arthritis comes in many different flavors and forms. And when we talk about arthritis, it starts with two main categories, inflammatory arthritis and non-inflammatory arthritis. And really, the main difference between these two is one is mediated from the immune system, the inflammatory arthritis and the other is mediated through uh, mechanical damage to cartilage within the joint. And uh, listed here are some of the most common causes. The most common cause I see in my practice in the non-inflammatory side is post-traumatic and uh, just plain old osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. which is more of a wear and tear of the joint that happens over time. And then inflammatory arthritis, the most commonly that I see is rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree with you on that. And I think that I think the important point is that although there are multiple reasons why you develop arthritis, usually the end stage of arthritis is essentially uh, is cartilage damage. Correct. And, yeah. So I mean, just to just to go into a little bit more, I mean, every a, a lot of one of my most common questions is for my patients is you know what is arthritis? You know, we use that phrase left and right. So the origins of the word is arthro, which means joint, and itis, which is inflammation. So arthritis literally means joint inflammation. And the root cause of that is cartilage damage. So at the end of the day, you know, it could be due to a wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis, or it could be infection or injury like post-traumatic arthritis or autoimmune, which is inflammatory based. But at the end of the day, you lose your you have a damage to your cartilage, which leads to a loss of cartilage. That loss of cartilage leads to an increased friction environment within your joint. And then that increased friction leads to inflammatory particles, which irritate your joint lining or your synovium. And then that then manifests as joint pain and stiffness. Yeah. And then Dr. Wong, just one question. I, uh, um, I, we know it's a damaged cartilage, but what actually is cartilage and what does it do for the joint? So uh, the main thing is that it's a, car, uh, so car, a joint is where two bones meet to accommodate motion. And 
And in order to accommodate motion, you have to have a low friction interface. So I, I like I like to think of cartilage as being almost like an ivory-like surface at the end of at the ends of our bones, and that ivory-like surface leads to a very very smooth low friction environment. But in, but as we age or as time progresses, that uh, that smooth surface then begins to erode away, and what we're left with is like this high friction, almost like sandpaper-like interface. So if you can imagine sandpaper rubbing on sandpaper, that's not a that's a very painful image in my mind. Yeah. But, but besides pain, I mean, what, what other symptoms do your patients usually complain about when they come in with arthritis? Um, the most common symptom we've talked about a few times already is pain. That's usually what brings people into the office. Um, but other symptoms that come along with arthritis include swelling, uh, warmth around the joint, stiffness. There can be redness around the joint. Uh, patients will complain of their knee giving out on them, locking on them. And then uh, they just continue to notice that the shape of their leg or the length of their leg is changing. Mm -hmm. And um, those are the most commonly things patients with arthritis complain about when they come in to see me. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I tend to find uh, that those are the, the most common complaints, but it's important to note that they don't all show up at the same time. Like arthritis is like it's a progression of symptoms depending on how, uh, how bad the arthritis is. So for me, what I've, uh, what I've noticed is that if people have mild arthritis or arthritis is just starting, they tend to have more stiffness and soreness. And it tends to be when they're trying to get up and move around. So they have difficulty with initiation. So getting, it's like starting, starting moving around in the morning, or if they've been sitting for a while, getting up and walking around, they'll notice a period of stiffness and soreness and, they, and then it gradually goes away. But as the arthritis becomes more involved, they start noticing these aggravating maneuvers where they where they just happen to you know really just hit that arthritis dead on. So for knees, it tends to be more common with twisting and pivoting when you're changing directions, and then when you're when you're going up and downstairs, more likely when you're going downstairs, and it just with prolonged walking, they, they they notice that when they do these maneuvers, it tends to get their their pain tends to increase or it becomes more common. And then with hip, because it's a ball with the hip pain, because it's a ball and socket joint, they tend to notice pain more in the when they're when they're rotating. So when they're trying to put on their shoes or their socks, when they're rising from a chair, the more when they're going upstairs rather than downstairs, and also with with increased and with, with increased walking. And then usually when the arthritis gets really really bad, these aggravating symptoms just kind of these aggravating factors tend to all run together and they're just and people tend to be in constant pain or aching they they can't sleep at night they can't get into a comfortable position and and eventually they do let they 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 get they lead to some form of deformity so they they, they end up being bow legged or not knee or sometimes they complain that one leg is longer than the other sure sure now um, when we're, we're talking about hips and knees is Arthritis on, or Uncle Arthur? Does Uncle Arthur only live in hips and knees, or can he affect other joints in the body? I would say Uncle Arthur can be anywhere. I mean, anywhere there's a joint, you can have arthritis. I, I, I mean, in my experience, I feel that with hip and hip and knee arthritis tend to be more common in the wear and tears, like the post traumatics and the osteoarthritis. But then you know the upper extremities or the small joints, they tend to be more of the well, more of the rheumatoid arthritis, the inflammatory arthritis picture, you know, but I also think it's very important to know that just because you're a certain age and you have pain, it's not always arthritis. Um, so, uh, so, so how, how do you, how do you work up a patient that comes in with knee pain? Do you, I mean, what, what other, what other symptoms or causes can they have for their knee pain? Yeah. And that's a good question. And first, before we get into how we work it up, work up common arthritis, uh, it's also good to notice that um, just because you have hip or knee pain doesn't necessarily mean that you have arthritis. There's many other causes of hip and knee pain of structures that live around the hip and knee. Mm -hmm. All right, and some commonly cause, other causes of knee pain are you can see here, and we'll start off first with the tendonitis and bursitis. A bursa is a fluid sac that goes between tendons and bones to help provide frictionless gliding of the tendon over the edge of bones. And those can become inflamed and around our knee, we have multiple bursa um, that can cause pain. The most commonly one I see is the Pes tendon bursa, which is pain on the inside part of your knee, 
but it's not quite at the knee joint, it's just below. And another common tendonitis that I see is also the pes tendons, the quadriceps tendons, and the patella tendon. And then a lot of, a very common cause that I see, especially in women, is anterior knee pain from patellofemoral syndrome. And that has multiple causes, but it's mostly the biggest uh, message to take from that is that is a non-surgical treatment and gets better with uh, conservative treatments, which we will discuss here um, later in the talk. And then lastly, lower back pain um, with uh, radiculopathy or you've heard of sciatica can also present as knee pain as the nerves run over the front part of the knee, as you can see here in the diagram. And then lastly, hip arthritis can be referred to the knee. So your knee may look great, but then we get an x-ray of your hip and it's actually, you have arthritis in your hip. So pain in the knee can go to the hip and pain in the hip can go to the knee. And that leads me to next talk about what actually are causes of hip pain that is not arthritis. Normally hip pain uh, related to arthritis is more in the groin. I most commonly see patients come in thinking they have hip arthritis and complaining of pain on the side of their hip or pain when they try to lay on their side when sleeping. And that is usually related to another bursa, your greater trochanteric bursa, um, which is one of the most common non-arthritic causes of hip pain I see. And then just as in the knee, a uh, pinched nerve in the lower back can also go to uh, the hip and refer pain there as well. No, I, I agree completely. I found that, you know, a, 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 at least 25% of the patients that come in with hip pain, it's usually not, it's actually not hip arthritis. It tends to be more bursitis or low back pain or sciatica. And then for, and then for a lot of my knee pain patients are actually more tendonitis patients also. And I think what is important is, you know, that's how we focus so much on the individual patient, not just on the x-ray that we're shown. And, you know, that, and that leads us into our next topic on how, how do you diagnose arthritis? And, the, and I feel like the hallmark for that is really the history and the physical exam. I mean, what I've, uh, I've well, as you mentioned earlier, I found that, you know, for, uh, for, 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 uh, for history, for a physical exam specifically, you know, people that have low back pain or they, they think they have hip pain, but they'll specifically say they have pain more in their butt cheek, you know, or people that have um, bursitis, it's specifically more because they'll complain about they have difficulty sleeping on their side, you know, or, and then with hip arthritis, it's specifically, you know, they, it's usually more of a groin pain and pain that occasionally travels to their knee. And, and I've also found that with knee pain, I mean, pe people with arthritis, they can usually point with one finger and they say, my, my knee hurts right here. And then you just pick a pull up on the x-ray and you'll know exactly what you're talking about. But if people tend to complain more of a global, global knee pain, oh, it just hurts all over, or hurts and it runs down the back of my leg, you kind of know it's, he may have arthritis on x-ray, but we need to check, we need to do a thorough exam of the back and of the hip. I mean, and what, what experiences have you had? For sure. I completely agree. Uh, really finding the root cause of the pain because there's a lot of times I'll see arthritis on the x-ray, but it's necessarily not what's causing the symptoms. And those patients I think are most vulnerable for having a surgery and not having a good outcome after the surgery because mm -hmm. we treated something we saw on x-ray, but we failed to see what we, what they were actually hurting on physical exam. And so it's, I think it's, you hit the nail on the head when you said not treating the x-ray, but treating the patient. Exactly. But I think we're really lucky because at the end of the day, the, the gold standard for first intervention is going to be non-operative management. And luckily, most of these pain, most of these problems are actually all treated more or less the same right, right from the get-go, right? Yeah, exactly. So now that we've arrived at the diagnosis of arthritis, um, uh, why don't you walk me through how you go about treating a patient with a new diagnosis of arthritis? Perfect. So always when we see a patient for the first time with arthritis, we want to start with non-operative management because a lot of patients can su successfully be treated with non-operative management. And those are usually start with an anti-inflammatory medication, an oral one, as well as a topical one for me. And then physical therapy or home exercise program, activity modification, bracing, weight loss, and then if these aren't working, we can get a little more invasive with injections. But starting with anti-inflammatory medication, 
uh, when and kind of what kind of anti-inflammatory medications do you prescribe to your patients? No, I, I agree completely. I think it's important to focus on non-operative managers more about preservation of activity. You know, we're trying to control your symptoms and preserve your, your daily life to keep you happy. Now, uh, as far as anti-inflammatories, I actually think that over the aggregate of patients, they all are equally effective. But you have to look at patients as individuals. I mean, I have some patients that that swear by Advil and they can't, they say Aleve doesn't do anything for them. And I have other patients that love Aleve because it's a twice a day pill and they don't want to take Advil four times a day. I think you just have to kind of figure out which one works best with the patient. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that these anti-inflammatories have a pain relieving component as well as an anti-inflammatory component. And the anti-inflammatory component usually is a delayed reaction. So you have to take these for around two to three weeks before they'll really see that. And that's something I cancel them on uh, when I when I initially prescribe them. The other um, the other new thing is that the Volterran gel, which is a topical anti-inflammatory, is now over the counter. And I, I find that a lot of patients really like having a topical versus a pill um, um, pill option. I mean, do you, do you find you use that a lot in your practice? I do, um, especially in my patients who can't take anti-inflammatory medications, whether it be for heart disease, kidney disease, where they've had uh, gastric ulcers in the past. Those patients, I think, are great candidates to try a topical anti-inflammatory because it doesn't get as, highly, as high of a level of anti-inflammatory in their bloodstream. Um, and so that's, uh, but I like combining both to kind of hit it at both ends. And then um, usually always with anti-inflammatories, I'll prescribe a home exercise program or physical therapy, but I'll often have pushback from some of my younger patients who are more active and exercise routinely. Uh, for your patients who are kind of the same, uh, the same kind of activity level, what do you tell your patients about physical therapy? Well, I, I, what I try to explain to them is there's a difference between exercise for overall health and exercise as far as rehabilitation. Because the main thing is that usually when you have a tendonitis or any type of inflammatory picture, a lot of it's because you're doing some type of maneuver wrong and you need a physical therapist to kind of overlook your actual workout and make modifications so that that, so a tendonitis doesn't become a tender rupture. And I think, and a lot of the physical therapy goal is preservation of range of motion and preservation of strength. And at the end of the day, they may not be doing physical therapy that often. It may, it may just be two or three visits and then establish a good home exercise program. And that's something I make sure that they know they're not, they're not signing up for physical therapy for six months straight. <laughs> sure, exactly. And, um, and then leading out of the physical therapy realm, when they get back into the gym, and back into activities of daily living, are there any things that you try to have your patients avoid or replace what they're doing currently with? I think the buzzword is um, impact avoidance activities or, avo or avoiding high impact activities. That's anything where your entire body weight lifts off the ground and then, and then drops down on one of your legs. And the classic example is recreational running or jogging. Those are the things you really want you to avoid. But, you know, elliptical is great. Hiking is great. Walking is great. And uh, I'm a big fan of prop I'm a proponent of swimming. You know, we're lucky because we live in Texas, so you can swim nine months out of the year. Yeah. But I think that's a great cardio workout. It works. It's good for resistance and range of motion. Uh, what, uh, are there any specific uh, tips that you recommend for your patients? Yeah, I, I agree. I try to avoid the high impact stuff. Um, one other high impact activity I try to keep my patients off of is a stair climber. Mm -hmm. As well, I think that puts a lot of stress in the front part of the knee. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I like water. I like swimming, mm -hmm. water aerobics. They kind of take your body weight out of the picture and provide a high resistance uh, environment for high caloric loss, especially my patients who are trying to lose weight with arthritic yes. joints. Yeah. And then, uh, do you ever get asked about bracing options? I, I do, and I think bracing has its uh, place in treating osteoarthritis. Uh, the, the braces aren't tip, or aren't the typical kind of braces you'll find at Academy or CVS. These are more uh, specialized and we call them unloader braces and they function in a way that they're able to unload the part of the joint that's been damaged and transfer some of that load to the part of the joint that is healthy. The hardest part is getting patients to agree to wear these on a day-to-day -day basis. So if a patient states to me that they think it's something they would use, I always try it. But if they tell me they're going to wear it to their car and then take it off. Then I usually 
We'll tell them to save their money. Yeah, I agree completely. And, and the last thing I always give a patient, you know, during, after their, during their first evaluation with a new diagnosis of arthritis is usually some form of injection. I usually recommend a steroid injection or a cortisone injection first. I like to think of it as a focus, like dose of anti-inflammatory, like kind of like you're putting a grenade of anti-inflammatory directly in the knee. And I think it calms down the inflammation immediately and it gets over that, it gets people over that acute flare. Uh, do you have a restriction on how often you allow the people to have injections? I usually tell my patients uh, three times a year or every three to four months yeah. um, for the steroid injections. And then if that isn't helping them, um, or say they tell me they had an injection and it lasted for a few weeks, and then but they aren't still aren't ready for surgery, that's kind of when I go into the other type of injection that's most commonly given, and that's the hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. injection or gel injection, rooster cone injection, all the same mm -hmm. same concept. But by having these or by how these injections work, is it acts as a um, a gel that we put into the knee that's very hydrophilic and will absorb water. Mm -hmm. And then once that absorbs the water in there, we thought that it would provide a, a cushion or a, a smooth um, uh, surface for your joint to glide on kind of like an oil change. Yeah. Um, but they also have an anti-inflammatory property and that yes. may be where they get some of the pain relief with these. The, the difference between these is these you usually have to give three times rather yeah. than just once. But no matter what, when you're talking about injections with your doctor, keep in mind that if you have an injection you'll, and it only lasts for a few weeks and then you decide you want surgery, you're going to have to wait three months because the, the risk of infection is too high if we um, do surgery within that three months of an injection. I tend to use that period as a, 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 as a time to get clearances. So, you know, cause yeah. I mean, because it's the knee replacements or hip replacements are a big surgery. So I usually recommend people go see or get a clearance from the primary care and maybe a cardiologist. And that takes time, and then we can use the time while they're waiting for the injection to wear off to get those clearances and done. Sure, yeah, sure. Well, you've uh, there's these new injections coming out, um, the stem cells and the PRPs. Do you use any of those in your practice? Do you find them to be beneficial? I've I, I, I've, 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 I've I've talked to a lot of patients about them before. Um, I find that most a lot of the patients will come in which have had the injections done from a, by another provider. And some of them say it does really, really well. And, and other patients tend to say that, you know, it, it didn't work as much as they wanted them to work. I think that I think the jury is still out on the literature for that. The main thing is that uh, you have to realize that a P, we, we do these injections and PRPs and stem cell injections for a lot of injury patients, for like, for like tendon tears, and ligament tears, and ligament sprains. And then the literature for that is very supportive. But the literature for actual arthritis there actually isn't, aren't many big studies out there. So, I, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't work or they do work. I think that it's, I think that we, time will tell on this front. You know? Yeah, and, and I agree with everything you said. And it, uh, and the biggest thing that I tell my patients is the, these injections, while some of them may provide some relief, they don't necessarily repair or replace the cartilage that's been damaged. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the goal of all these non-operative treatments is to, decrease the inflammation, which then decreases the pain, the swelling, and improves the function. Mm -hmm. But we aren't necessarily fixing the root cause. Yeah. And that's um, something that can only be done with surgery. Yeah. And then usually what we say, and usually after we've exhausted non-surgical management, so so if they've been on the anti-inflammatories, if they've done the exercise plan, if they've had multiple injections and they're just not cutting it, at that point, that's when we step up the discussion and talk about surgical treatment. And I, and, I, and I would say the majority, the gold standard at this point would be a, would be total or uh, would be total hip or total knee replacements. Now, I think that's a huge talk all on its own. I think Dr. Doherty is going to the next. Uh, he's going to be talking a lot about that next week. So we're going to kind of make the audience wait for that one. Yeah. So tune in for next week to see Dr. Doherty talk about joint replacements. Well, I'll say the uh, the most common question I get asked uh, quite frequently is when is it time to to take the leap? When should I talk? Of, when should I take a, have a uh, go forward and get that joint replacement? Uh, how do you answer that for your patients? Yeah, and that's a, a great question. And I, I think this is one of the funnest parts of my job is making this decision making with these mm -hmm. patients to help them and make them feel better. And really, it's a discussion that we have. I, and when they're no longer responding to conservative treatment mm -hmm. and 
and they're not having fun with life or enjoying what they do on a day-to-day basis. And Uncle Arthur is kind of running their life and, and telling them what they do every day. Uh, that's when I tell my patients it's time to take that leap, um, when they're starting to lose uh, the enjoyment that they have in their day-to-day life. Exactly. So, I mean, when, whenever, whenever you can't do the things you want to do to make you happy, you got to serve the eviction notice to Uncle Arthur, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I agree. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for tuning in. And then please join us next week for the next uh, next uh, Tell All Total Joint Talk. Yeah, and thank you very much. And if you, there's anything we can do for you here at UT Ortho, please feel free to call us and come in and see us. We'd love to help you. Oh, before we forget, um, before we forget, we did want to touch on with the with the whole COVID pandemic thing that's going on. That we do, we are offering telemedicine visits. We do do a lot of screening in our clinics. We do have a firm no touch policy, so it's a very safe environment. So. You don't feel like you have to suffer in silence and suffer alone. We're, we are here to take care of you, and we do, and we value your safety as the most important thing. Definitely, and just because COVID's around, Uncle Arthur isn't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're still able to treat you safely, and we have the option of a, a, a COVID-free hospital at Memorial Hermann Orthopedic and Spine Hospital. Excellent. Take care, guys. All right. Bye. <laughs>